afternoon for tonight's adventure with the fat man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fat, and Mud City is where the butterflies are free. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. All right, so this one starts with my last episode, Flipper's Revenge, and a couple of comments I received regarding dolphins being symbolic of Phoenicia and of the Oracle at Delphi, which made me want to take a deeper dive into dolphins, right? Especially after reconnecting them to the Mud City Paradigm puzzle tree via the Indigo Hotel fire and the investment firm Oriental Dolphins, right? And right near the top of my first search for dolphin symbolism, I found out that the dolphins were stamped onto the Tyrian shekel for hundreds of years, right? Shekel is a word that's still in use today for loose change, right? And and so it's stamped on here along with the owl. Yeah, I'm sure no coincidence there, right? And these are from the fourth century BC, right? And they can be had today. I mean, you can just buy them at V coins, right? 2,500 year old coins. I mean, there's one here for 30 bucks. <laughs> I think that's amazing. But even more amazing than that is that the dolphin is on the Tyrian money because the root tier has been playing such a big part in this thing not only with the County Tyrone in Ireland, but also David Terrell, right? The virologist, the man who discovered the coronavirus. And so I decided it was time to take a closer look at Tyr, which is in present day Lebanon, right? And I, I love the symbol on the coat of arms, right? It's kind of how I imagine the Mud City Paradigm puzzle tree looking, right? And, and it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. It's the birthplace of legendary figures like Cadmus, who we're gonna talk more about in a little bit, right? Phoenix, and we all know what phoenixes are all about, right? And Dido, the founder of Carthage, right? It's, it's a port city that dates back to 2750 BC, right? And it becomes the most powerful city in Phoenicia because that's where the royal dye is made. Every dynasty in the world coveted this purple dye, right? Which is made from the murex snail. <laughs> and, and the murex snail is a predatory sea snail. Who knew there were such things as predatory sea snails, right? And look at the spikes on some of these shells, right? right? And the, so the dye is made from the mucus of this large predatory mollusk. The most prized dye in all the ancient world is made from snail slime. How gross is that? Right? But, but it's so prized that the Phoenicians actually get their name from this, right? Greek Phoenician is literally translates to purple people. Hey, which puts a whole kind of new spin on the one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. Hey, maybe that beast wasn't purple. He was eating purple people. Because <laughs> right, we have to remember that, you know, pe purple and royalty go together like peanut butter and jelly. And in our modern world, let's not forget that red and blue make purple. <laughs> and so it's an island city connected to the mainland by a kilometer long causeway. That's that's 2.2 miles. Right, built by Alexander the Great in 332 BC, which you can get a 66 out of if you try, right? And so how did he do it? I mean, that's a massive undertaking. Right, but this article doesn't get into that, right? It just goes right back to the money. And I think it's interesting that the owl has the the crook and flail of the of Osiris, right? Especially because Tyr was an Alexandrian mint city, right? So not only was the purple dye, so not, so not only was the purple dye being made there, but so was the green, you know, the money, or in this case, silver, you know, which is what most shekels were made from. And so it was a currency so strong that it was accepted in Hebrew temple despite its pagan associations. And Tyrian silver may have been what was used to pay off Judas Iscariot, right? Later issues of the shekel replaces the dolphin or supplements it, with the image of Tyr's patron god Melkart, who's riding a hippocampus at the winged head. <laughs> Where's that fish? Now, I'd never heard of this hippocampus before, but I did know that the hippocampus was part of the brain, that it plays an important part in memory development and in navigation, right? And there's that maritime keyword again, right? But I actually have no understanding, though. I'm sure I'd come across the, the word or the information before, but like at the aquarium or something, but I just never made the connection to that hippocampus and to seahorses before, right? right? But this this gets even better, right? Because the hippocampus is is made of two interlocking parts. The hippocampus proper, which is also known as Ammon's horn. Right? I read that 
I was like, what? Ammon's horn? Like, Ammon, like, Baal Ammon? <laughs> but but I kind of blew that because it's Baal Haman, right? But that's that's very close, right? And so what is Ammon? What is Ammon and his horn? <laughs> and so Ammon is an ancient Canaanite culture, right? It's where the Ammonites come from, <laughs> which makes sense. Right? And they were always in conflict with the Israelites, you know, because who was in conflict with the Israelites? <laughs> but I, I think it really does refer to Baal, who so often rocks the horned look, right? like he's doing here, right? And especially when you compare it, like, to the seahorse tail, right? And so what I'm getting from all of this is that Baal, whom the Tyrians call Melchor, <laughs> is subconsciously reinforcing who the real god is, you know, money, by having the image of himself riding this hippocampus, and the hippocampus is representing the memory, right? Remember who your God is and who supplies your money and who you need to give money to, right? <laughs> and you have to remember there are dolphins usually on these things as well. You know, the dolphin oriental, um, the oriental dolphins investment firm. You know, so dolphins and money, you know, playing a weird kind of part in here, right? And I haven't even gotten to the other dolphin symbolism yet, but I did want to take a closer look at Melkart. All right, and so here he is, right? And he's associated with the monarchy, you know, of course, because of the royal bloodline that's created, connected to him, right? The sea, right? Because the Phoenicians are seafaring people, right? Colonization, you know, what have we been talking about this whole time? You know, planting right? Ulster and the Americas, right? Right? And he's, you know, he's associated with a commercial enterprise, commercial success, you know, because of the dye and how all these dynasties come to tear to get this freaking dye, right? This purple dye, the indigo, <laughs> hotel indigo, right? And that, and so, and so, not only is he the major deity of tear, right? He's 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 venerated abroad, right? <laughs> all right, but it does, but it does say that firsthand information from the Phoenicians is scarce, right? Because of course it is. Right? And that details of his worship and mythology are lacking. Right? But he is considered God and king, you know, establishing that connection, that royal bloodline connection, as we were talking about, royalty to godliness, right? That future dynasties the world over are going to take advantage of. Right? And out of tear, the practice draws criticism from Ezekiel. Yeah, that Ezekiel, the, the Hebrew prophet who saw the UFO, right? The spinning wheels. Right? Because they found temples to Melark as far back as the 10th century BC, but not any earlier than that, which I think is kind of interesting, right? And so these temples are found all over the Phoenician world in their colonies, right? Com complete with altars for sacrifices and offerings, you know, because there are times right, when human sacrifices, largely children, were made to appease Melkart, right? <laughs> You know, that's our ball, right? You know, and interesting, too, how close Melkart sounds to Moloch. You know, it's not exact, right? But it's, it's close, right? Because Melkart here is just a uniquely Tyrian name for the Canaanite Baal, who is Moloch, right? It's all the same guy, right? So finding all of this out and connecting the dolphin to the Phoenician money and, right, and connecting the Phoenician money to Baal and the hippocampus, you know, which represents our memory, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And so I want to, so what else is there in this, in this dolphin symbolism? <laughs> right? and, and so dolphin symbolism is found all over the ancient world, right? It's in the Levant, it's in the Mediterranean, it's in India, right? The Ganges and in China and, and both the Americas, right? And they are universally a symbol of protection, right? Especially to the sailor. And they are guardian and guide of souls as they travel to the underworld, right? And maybe that deals more with sailors or maybe it's everybody, I don't know, but Interesting that the dolphins are associated with the underworld, right, and carrying souls there. Right? And the dolphin is also a symbol of rebirth and reincarnation and renewal. You know, so kind of interesting now that, you know, the dolphins are sort of reappearing in the Thames and the Hudson, you know, with that Thames and Hudson publishing company and that history book and everything. That's really, you know, is, is that a sign of renewal there of some form or something? You know, I don't know. But, you know, I was going to go over a few more of the of the bigger mythological stories, but I decided against that. But before I before I move on, I did want to share this though. Right? That the in the Amazon, right, these Bojo dolphins right, were believed to be shapeshifters and that they mated with human women. Right? Now, that puts a good spin on things, doesn't it? Right? Right? You know, they also they were Poseidon's errands they were Poseidon's errand boys, right? And they tied to Dionysus in several different ways, of course, because everything Ties back to Dionysus in some way, shape, or form. 
right into apollo and the oracle at delphi and these are all they're all great fun stories and you should go read them but there is one dolphin myth that we need to talk about right and that's the tale that's the greek myth of melicartes all right and so allegedly the greeks reimagined our new friend melcard here as this melicertes right who was in this myth drowns with his mother after which they are transformed into sea deities his Melicertes becomes Palaemon, and his mother, Ino, Eno, becomes Leucothea. All right, and so I noticed here that it said that his mother, Eno, I know, <laughs> whatever you ever want to say, right? She was the daughter of Cadmus, who, remember, we just talked about it. He was born in Tyr. And so I wanted to take a closer look at Melicertes' here, his grandfather. All right, and there he is. <laughs> right, and he was the founder and first king of Thebes. You know, that sounds like a pretty big deal, right? But he was also, along with Perseus and this Bellerophon, right? the greatest hero and slayer of monsters. Right? And I love how they use the singular hero here to talk about a trio of heroes. Right? And there he is on this vase or whatever. He's fighting the serpent dragon, <laughs> the worm. Right? And so anyway, Melcertes' tale is tragic, right? Because he suffers for the sins of his mother. I know. You know, <laughs> and who, has, who has angered Hera because she fosters Dionysus, right? Him again, right? And, you know, now, so now this makes actually Dionysus Melcertes' foster brother. And so by Eno taking in Dionysus into their family, right? This, this gets Hera so mad that she drives Eno's husband, Athemus, right? Drives him mad and he kills one of their sons. And when he's coming for, for Eno and for Melicartes, right? She, she scoops them up and she jumps off a cliff into the ocean where they die. Right? And the gods take pity on them and turn them into sea gods. You know, here, I know, right? she, she turns into this Luakotha, right, who is a water nymph, right? And any chance to show Waterhouse's water nymph painting is, a, is one that needs to be taken, right? And, right? But the interesting thing about her wiki page was that they had a sea also, right, that said this 35 Luakotha. Right, and, which, and so, which is a large asteroid in the asteroid belt, right? which was discovered in 1855. How did they find that thing in 1855? Right? Some other time I'll have to check in on that, right? But here's a three-dimensional model of it, right? In this poor CGI rendering. You know? Somehow they found this thing in 1855, but this is the best that they can do 150 years later, right? And so I'm not sure why Leucothea was chosen as its name, but it's crazy how the Mud City Paradigm puzzle tree just branched out this story into flat earth. <laughs> and so and so now that's that's Leucothea, right? So, but let's get back to Melicartes and this polyamon that he turns into. And so that article that I had read about the myth, right, there was no hyperlink for a Paleomon wiki article from there. All right. And so I had to do a little fishing, right? And there's no and it says here that there's no satisfactory origin for the name Paleomon which literally translates to wrestler, right? And this connects him to Heracles, right? Apparently there are a couple of different Heracles myths and this Melicartes is connected to him in several ways, as is Mel Melcart too, I believe, right? But definitely not Hercules of the 12 labors, right? All right, but a Google search of the word Paleomon tells me that it's a genus of shrimp, right? And I also found this World Register of Marine Species, right? Or worms, <laughs> and I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Right? Right, and over here on the on the right is a is a drawing of Paleomon riding some hideous shrimp beast. Right? And so if Paleomon equals Melicertes, right? and Melicertes equals Melcart, and Melcart equals Baal, <laughs> I doubt the uh, I doubt the irony of turning the greatest Phoenician god into a shrimp was lost on the writers of the <laughs> of Greek mythology. Right? But this thing this story only gets crazier, right? right? Because unfortunately. You know, when I did my original rabbit hole on this one, I, you know, I try to recreate them for my videos and I could not recreate how I found this Paleomon and Jetus in a Google search. This was just, you know, in a window search. And I, I don't know how, but so I ran with it, right? And it brought me, and it brought me to this page here about these coins. And this one depicts the story of Paleomon and Jetus introducing the dolphin. And so in my research here, I have to wonder if Jetus is related to the Greek Cetus, which means sea monster, right? But, you know, I don't know, I, I may have just made that up, right? But a little further down the search page, I found this entry for the catalog of Dinoral Lepidoptera, 
all right, that has both Jetus and Polyamon listed here. Right, and here's the title page. I clipped the date out, right? But I think it was the 1880s, if I remember correctly, right? And so in case you don't know, Dinoral Lepidoptera, you know, they're butterflies, right? You know, and here's the, uh, the Cyrus, the Sirius Paleomon, right? Look at this guy. Hey, he looks like a stormtrooper. And I'm thinking this genus of butterfly is one where the male is the fancier of the two, because I'm guessing that on the top, that's the female there, right? All right, but so now I can connect the butterfly to Paleomon. Who is Melkart, right? And Melkart to the hippocampus, which is memory, right? And so can you see where this is going? <laughs> right? That's that's right. It's going to MK Ultra, <laughs> right? And Project Monarch, which which was allegedly started in Nazi Germany, which is where all your good mind control programs begin, and the use of memory manipulation and false memories to create Manchurian candidates or sleeper agents, right? Easily programmable slaves. You know, and it's alleged that these techniques are used among members of the entertainment industry as well as in the Epstein-like sex trafficking and prostitution rings, you know, right? and reaching the highest levels of governments and stuff. Right? I mean, that's what the conspiracies are out there, right? All right, and it cannot be a coincidence connecting the butterfly to the hippocampus and the hippocampus to ball. I mean, because what are we talking about here right, with this false history paradigm? You know, how much can we trust our memory? You know, isn't the Mandela effect merely a controlled psyop that preys on our weakened minds and sense of personal history by getting us to doubt and mistrust our memories? Right? That's what it does. That's what the Mandela effect does. Right? It's creating an easier mind to manipulate. Right? And, is the, and as this great reset goes forward, you know, let's not forget that they're already doing a pretty good job of erasing history because... That's the last thing you want if you're trying to shift the paradigm. You know, try to change Western civilization from first world country to third world country, right? and from free market to complete state control. You know, you don't want people to have a good understanding of their past. I mean, you just don't. All right, so to close this one out, I don't think it's a coincidence that all these elements can be brought back to Baal and, and Baal back to Baltimore and the Johns Hopkins School of International Studies and their government-funded psychological warfare programs. <laughs> I, I mean, so, okay, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I had a whole lot of fun bringing it to you. And, and so remember, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies, right? Okay, so until the next one, cheers, guys.